A very good morning participants. Uh, today's theme is environmental technologies. Uh, today is the last day for this online faculty development pro program being conducted by Faculty of Architecture and Planning Lucknow. So we have our first speaker for the day. He has contributed to significant changes in public discourse, law and policy for sustainable water resource management in India. His research interests span environmental management with particular emphasis on water policy, catchment planning, river restoration and eco hydrology. He holds PhD from Faculty of Policy and Planning, Terry School of Advanced Studies, New Delhi, with major research focus on water resource management. He has been working as Associate Professor of Environmental Sciences at Baba Sahib Bheem Rao Ambedkar University, Lucknow, since 2005. He is a Fulbright Fellow and British Chevling Scholar. He has guided five doctoral candidates and supervised more than 35 master theses on different aspects of water resources, management and environmental planning. I present you Dr. Venkatesh Datta to address you. Sir, over to you, please. Uh, thank you so much for this nice introduction. Uh, am I audible and my screen is uh, okay? Yes, sir. We can hear you and the screen is also visible. Uh, so you can see my full screen or there is some panel also? I could uh, see it's one full panel. Screen. Okay, so, so there is nothing on the slide? Yeah. Yes, yes, we are on the slide, first slide. Okay. So a very good morning to all of you. I hope you are doing sound and uh, you know healthy in this uh, Corona pandemic. And uh, today is last day of this faculty development program. I was delighted to note the theme of the uh, uh, faculty development program, uh, touching upon various aspects of uh, you know environmental planning, urban planning, design, and all those issues which touch upon you know our larger uh, quality of life. So today uh, I would be talking upon uh, how do you integrate, uh, you know, blue and green space uh, into your urban and regional planning and how do you uh, see the land use in totality with a holistic approach of uh, seeing, uh, you know, the entire catchment, entire watershed, entire uh, planning unit as a union of, uh, you know, multiple environmental resources. So I've been, uh, working in this university since last 15 years uh, we have set up a river system and aquatic ecology lab and we work primarily on uh, river restoration uh, land use planning uh, zoning and uh, also on uh, aquatic systems you know integrating the uh, aquatic lives with uh, the quality of the environment so these are some of the recent publications uh, you can download from internet on fluvial habitat water quality, uh, environmental flows, catchment planning. I've been also working on uh, pollution mapping uh, in various urban rivers and uh, also trying to establish the legitimate requirement of uh, you know, water bodies. Like we ask from the human beings what they want from a catchment, but we never go and ask a river or a water stream, what are their expectations? So there's a concept of uh, minimum environmental flows that should be there in our water bodies. And uh, there are various models. So we have been also working on trying to find out uh, what are their legitimate water requirements uh, to sustain the ecosystem. These are some of the uh, popular articles. I feel that uh, as a researcher and an academician, you should talk in a language which is understood by all. You know, we have a peer community of uh, academicians and researchers and that is good you know publishing in a scientific journal but I also feel that writing to newspapers blogs and, and other popular media is very important because they would also influence the public policy landscape uh, these are some of the uh, you know newspaper uh, cuttings which I have on river restoration where I talked that you have to take into account the entire catchment the entire river basin and uh, how do you develop the model of uh, you know urban rivers and uh, the the uh, banks of the river the river terrace uh, these are some of the uh, you know articles i won't go into detail uh, first of all uh, uh, this panel is uh, you know if you see the land use and land cover 
they are very big element into your map uh, whenever you do start urban and regional planning and uh, they are pretty pervasive you know when you aggregate the entire land use and land cover they would define how a city would look like so basically they would define the character of a city they would also define how your major infrastructure such as roads and your water supply network sewerage network your parks and amenities they would function in future because you uh, you don't know the dynamics that is going to happen in times to come there are many drivers and pressures and impact so your your infrastructure should just respond to these changing times and they should be flexible enough to to adapt to to develop enough resilience for for future population many uh, environmental problems of a city is rooted in the way you do uh, land use planning you know and that is governed by your master plan you have regional plans you have uh, you know city wide plans but master plan is having the code of future development but we have been witnessing that uh, uh, you know the land governance is poorly regulated in india and that is due to uh, the inefficient institutional regimes we have uh, our town and country planning organization you you have some of the cities have uh, you know uh, the uh, development authorities like we have lucknow development authorities or or elawa development authorities or delhi development authorities but the kind of urban sprawl and urban ex expansion that is happening around these cities they do not conform well with the uh, land suitability and carrying capacity of the city so if you see the entire uh, you know aggregate of the land use you will see a lot of conflicts are there the city uh, uh, you know the entire carrying capacity of the city is jeopardized we are we have already overshoot many of the resources and obviously the forest and water bodies they suffer a lot due to unplanned development so i talk about uh, need to integrate uh, ecosystem in our management approaches in our planning why because all the uh, drainage or channels or water bodies they are not man made you know they are part of our natural heritage they have they have taken thousands and thousands of years to establish and how they establish they use the natural cycles of <clears throat> the seasonal floods and seasonal droughts and they they define the uh, the land suitability you know we have uh, yeah, like if i talk about uttar pradesh it is like uh, fifth biggest country in the world you know if you uh, if you uh, categorize the uh, countries in terms of population china is number 1 india is number 2 uh, us is number 3 indonesia is number 4 and uttar pradesh could have been the fifth largest country in the world so the kind of challenge we are facing is enormous and all these water bodies they have uh, decided the agro climatic zones now we have nine agro climatic zones in in the entire state and uh, water bodies they are they are one of the most productive ecosystems they produce and preserve fresh water they support wildlife they provide you uh, ecosystem services and uh, often we forget the role of ground water you know most of the cities are surviving on uh, the ground water even though we have rivers we have water supply but if you go to any city the ground water is a major source of water supply even for irrigation so it is a ground water that supports even river flows during dry seasons and we don't actually see it but but the kind of base flows you know the flow that is happening from ground water to to the water bodies is very important and lastly the tributaries the wetlands they support the life functions of a river a river should never be seen in isolation uh, there are many tributaries there are many side water bodies connected channels and pools and they support the functions of a river so in all our restoration in all our planning uh, we have four major objectives first of all we want to make the water quality ecology and hydrology up to the expectation of life supporting system you know we want uh, livable water quality we want a healthy ecological regime and secondly we want to maintain the flow uh, the continuum of the flow <clears throat> that is river is not a, 
you know a static water body it is a flowing stream so the continuity of the river is very important when you design any infrastructure project you have to see that uh, there is there is uh, no obstruction and river is able to perform the uh, free movement of uh, you know the sediment and all other systems uh, thirdly uh, we want to connect the riparian zones and stream bed you know appropriate structures we have uh, various uh, you know projects that disconnect the riparian zones with uh, with the with the uh, with the main channel and fourthly the most important objective is to reestablish the processes in our planning which can support the natural ecosystem within the watershed and reestablishing of the processes is not an end state it is a very dynamic and continuously evolving framework it's not a static framework that we want to uh, start with so even in our planning the master plan may look uh, static but in master plan you have to think about the third dimensions of supporting the natural ecosystem you know which we often forget as a planner so i made this uh, panchamrit you know the five uh, components of river restoration and restoration activities uh, the urban planners they have added one more that is aesthetic appeal but if you do these five things uh, you know aesthetic appeal, appeal would also come first of all we want to have clean water your uh, the water quality should be at least uh, up to swimmable and uh, bathable standards you can swim you can bath and you can even drink uh, after conventional treatment so this is our objective we want to make our river swimmable fishable and drinkable secondly we want to maintain the ecological flow regimes not be a static flow that you make one impoundment uh, from one area when the city starts developing you make a dam or reservoir and then when the city leaves again you make one dam or reservoir and your entire riverfront or the water body looks like a static water body that should not be the purpose because the river has multiple flow regimes it has to uh, it has to exhibit dry flow flushing flow low flow even uh, subsistence flow which is the base flow so you have to understand the flow should not be static and any obstructions should uh, should be avoided which which will uh, constrain the flow regimes thirdly you have to improve the biota the entire habitat some of the urban systems we often forget when we work with a built landscape we forget that uh, there are many components which would support our life system for example forest the micro forest the urban forest you know and those forests will be the source of biota the birds the butterflies the bees and all those you know uh, the dynamics which is happening in our urban system they would also avoid the heat island effect you know if you go to uh, uh, lohia park uh, you see uh, you feel so good you know but when you come to the concrete part uh, you you immediately feel that the temperature has gone up by 3 to 4 degrees so forest and urban forest particularly they are the the, the greatest source of amenities in terms of valued biota so even in cities like new york the concept of public parks and the uh, you know there is a very big park and uh, neighborhood park the concept of neighborhood park came came in but in the uh, in the uh, the new urban planning code people are giving more uh, you know recognition to the micro habitat which will influence the climate fourthly uh, the vegetation around the water bodies whenever you develop a built landscape the water body should not be seen just like a channel channel of water you have to also uh, develop the riparian vegetation and for that uh, the entire uh, you know the local variety the the uh, something which is very unique to that particular region should be planted sometimes you know we we just reject grasslands or weeds just like that but when i was in england uh, i saw people growing weeds also in their in their park and and i was quite surprised that uh, why there is this mixed kind of you know uh, grassland and there are some wild varieties growing in the urban garden but they said that you know it is very important to maintain the heterogeneity of the vegetation because you don't want to have a mono kind of uh, monoculture kind of you know uh, vegetation so you have to also look around the historical pattern of uh, vegetation and try to mimic uh, the nature 
when you uh, work with the concrete. And uh, finally, uh, the aquifers, the connected water bodies, the groundwater is very important because whenever you develop the concrete surface, you also lose the recharge potential. And once you lose the base flow, the rivers would be more, uh, you know, intermittent. There will not be enough water. So uh, the connected water bodies are very important and they would also recharge. And, and the aesthetic appeal, basically, it is more concerned with the, the planning and, uh, uh, you know, the town planning communities. They want the river park and gardens and cycle trails and all those things. But as an environmentalist, these are add-ons which we want to uh, uh, put into our urban stretch. But uh, generally speaking, when I see river, I do not like to categorize into uh, urban river or uh, rural river. You know, a river is a river, just like rose is a rose. Even though there are many varieties of rose, but basically the character of rose is it is a flower and it is a specific flower. So river should uh, be seen as a river in totality. So there's an immediate danger of, uh, you know, in urban planning to categorize uh, river into urban river. Basically, river is an urban catchment. Same river is there in the rural catchment. So the catchment should be used, not the urban, the term like urban river, because the moment you try to urbanize river, there's a tendency to occupy the immediate, uh, you know, river banks and uh, um, terraces. So I want to know if I'm audible and I'm clear at this point of time, any feedback? Because I am, I don't know if I'm talking to a blank screen because I don't know if I'm audible enough. Hello? Hello? Am I audible? Hello? Can someone give me any feedback because uh, I don't know if I'm audible and uh, my slides are seen clearly. Yes, sir, you, uh, sir, you are audible. Okay, okay, thank you. Because, you know, this is the problem with the uh, E-class because uh, sometimes you lose connectivity and you go on for one hour and then realize that anyways, uh, sorry no, no, for sir, this. Sir, audible whenever you will not audible or something problem we will tell you you are audible and your slides are also visible okay thank you so let me yes so coming back to uh, the main channel of the river uh, you know the when i talked about connectivity of the uh, river we forget the, the flood plain, the terrace, uh, the riparian vegetation. So if you see this slide, you will see that uh, there are uh, bank spills which are happening uh, during the flood season. And the bank spills are very important because they support during the flushing flows, the riparian forest buffer on the both side of the terrace. So this is the, uh, <clears throat> the one that you see in the dark color is a T0, is the base of the river terrace, one, terrace zero, but this is the T1 and T2 surface. So the terraces, immediate terraces of the river should be avoided for, for uh, urban, uh, you know, for any kind of uh, concrete uh, structure, because these are the areas they would support the healthy river functions. And, uh, you know, if you go back to your villages, uh, if you go connect to your, from wherever you are, uh, in your village, there would be many ponds and wetlands. And there would be also some or the other small river, and they would be all connected during monsoon, especially uh, in you know in the month of August. All the waters would overspill, and they would go back join the mainstream. That used to be very important for migration of species, you know, frogs and fishes. The juvenile fish would migrate to the main channel. The main channel would support them. So the smaller channels would be like a spawning ground, you know, for smaller species. And the moment the rain comes, they would all uh, uh, go to join the mainstream. I would remember during my childhood, I would I, I would catch fish using my mosquito net 
just in front of my house you know i would see large number of fishes flowing uh, on my road on immediately uh, in front of my house and what i would do i would just put a mosquito net and uh, catch many of the fishes and put in a water tank and i would also catch some of the frogs but these days we are not able to see those things happening because the entire drainage has been encroached the entire uh, migration pathways of these species have been encroached so these channel and wetlands connectivity is very important the riparian wetlands the riparian corridors and the forest so i want to show you this picture this is a river channel you can see the uh, the project this is the same picture uh, before and after uh, i want to ask you uh, uh, can you tell me which one is before and which one is after if you see this picture this is from uh, singapore uh, there was this project called active beautiful clean waters abc waters and this was designed to transform the water bodies beyond their functions of simple drainage and water supply you know and this project uh, continued for many years and a uh, very good project so if you see the first part it may look like this is after the project and the, the lower part is like before the project where you see more of the greens but it is not like that it was the first part was before and the second part that you see with more uh, you know natural river looking like system was after the project so they removed the concrete they designed the mosaic of the you know small green patches and you see the terrace forest and converted the entire built kind of uh, banks into a more vegetated bank and the aesthetic appeal was more but if you do the same thing in india people do not like the uh, this wild kind of you know habitat they see oh it, it is looking like drain and awful things because of dumping of solid waste but i want to ask you because you are from all designing communities can design influence public behavior this is a very big challenge in front of you as a practitioner as a as an academician uh, try to work out on designs on uh, models that could also influence the planning and uh, the mindset and the behavior of communities so after this project people have more sensitivity towards nature and natural setting you see there is this uh, small thing before here i put in this black color here before and this is after this is again after right but what is happening when we design uh, our uh, projects we have to consider five very important uh, you know components i gave you the components of restoration but in terms of uh, water sensitive urban design the land use planning should consider the vitality and sustenance of the growing population right this is very important your design should be should support the sustenance and vitality of the the living system right secondly you should identify the uh, the uh, you know the water bodies with the identification of cities the cities should be should be known by parks and water bodies not by buildings this is my feeling you know you may not like it but ultimately i would tell you this is very important these water bodies and what i call the the blues and greens they would save save you from future climatic uh, fluctuations and pandemic like corona you know all these wild habitats they are like buffer and uh, future cities would be known by forest and water bodies this is my feeling so we have to try to reinvent the wheel and try to put in uh, you know kind of design more uh, resilient structure which which is gelling well with the water bodies thirdly activities of the people you know well being the recreation design should be quite uh, you know supportive of your entire quality of life your well being so this is also linked to the vitality angle but the activity is more like a dynamic thing you know it is not very static it should be the design should give you more uh, you know scope and space for future uh, you know uh, adaptation and thirdly fourthly health the, the 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 food system the aquatic ecosystem or the hydroscape we have the term landscape but the hydroscape 
is basically those water bodies they would support the health of the ecosystem because the dry ecosystem you cannot uh, uh, you know visualize in a living city because uh, uh, the, the the water bodies would support the entire ecosystem and they would in turn support the biodiversity and the other aquatic life and the landscape a desirable landscape feature that communities love to be near you don't want to be in 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 front of uh, you know your house should not be near uh, a garbage dump or a landfill site the landfill it's so awful uh, especially in, in lucknow if you go towards i am sitapur road you find there is a ghela which is very close to river gomti and it is a big hip kind of mini mountain of uh, garbage and uh, you uh, uh, we we um, one of my students did her phd on the uh, how this garbage dump is affecting groundwater so we found that uh, the people living near uh, this garbage dump they had many diseases the skin diseases and the uh, you know the water quality was contaminated there were there, there were more water borne sickness so the landscape should be very pleasurable very aesthetic so that communities love to be Uh, near that landscape now coming back to the water the the blue space you know that many cities are uh, going to day zero uh, you know we had this last year uh, this uh, nairobi case that there is not enough water but this is actually true you know we consider that uh, we are endowed with sort of fresh water but many cities in india Jaipur, Kanpur, Dhanba, Jamshedpur, Amravati, Hyderabad, Bangalore, Coimbatore, Kochi, Kochi, Mumbai. They they are having uh, acute water scarcity. You know, there's not enough water which could uh, meet your uh, requirements. And uh, the World Develop the Water Development Report of 2015. I remember that they said by 2030, the existing fresh water of the world would only meet 60% of the requirements of people. so that means there would be 40% demands which would be unmet and uh, the reason is that the ground water is going deep and deep uh, there is loss of base flow if you remember i i gave you this term that ground water inflows and there was this newspaper article uh, last year that ganga is on the verge of drying there was a question mark but actually it is happening uh, you may not see ganga dry but if you see the smaller rivers which i am working upon uh, they are becoming intermittent this is a classic picture i i go to uh, you know a place called uh, lakhimpur uh, where uh, in the upper catchment of gomti river this is gomti river channel the lower one and you see in just one year this is uh, 2018 and this is 2019 uh, the, there was not water and this channel now has become intermittent so it used to be a perennial uh, most of the time so i searched and i did a lot of work on how uh, you know the the uh, the dry channel would affect the biodiversity and the aquatic life now think about it what would happen to the fishes and the frogs and turtles when there is a dry ecosystem and even the vegetation around it so there is a immediate shock turtles would find some cesspools and you know small water like this and they will bury inside but but if it continues for two three seasons you lose the entire ecosystem and this is happening actually most of the plain fed rivers are becoming intermittent these are some of the pictures you see that how the farmers they have encroached upon the active channel of the river by just putting dump and they are trying to encroach and this soon this river would be lost even our when we make a road or a bridge we just leave the debris because of the poor and faulty planning and this uh, obstructs the flow this fragments the channel and there is a pollution uh, logging of the pollutants upstream and uh, the farmers you know they try to once this your channel is dry you start encroaching and that is how you lose the river and this is happening in, across india this is very sad picture i am giving you but this is the ground picture of all small river systems their channels are fragmented and flows are obstructed so coming back to this blue and green space what are our expectations what as a urban and regional planning uh, communities <clears throat> what do we want to deliver we want to have green infrastructure we want to reduce the flood 
these are some of the indicators we want to improve health and well-being we want to improve the water quality and water course uh, uh, you know the aesthetics we want to support local food production very important because if you lose water in in the urban fringes what is happening uh, people are losing horticulture and agriculture because the water table is going down right so how do you achieve security of water supply so these are some of the terms which you can revisit uh, there are many types of water water is not just one type you know even the glass of water that you drink is just like a product it is a you have to pay for that water even water that you buy uh, in a pet bottle that is even uh, more you know so called i mean treated by many layers of treatment but but if you see the heterogeneity and uh, the quality differences there are many types of water like flood water environment uh, environmental water surface water runoff rain water waste water gray water black water green water drinking water irrigation water but one unifying uh, thing is that uh, they are part of hydrological cycle you know they are part of hydroecology uh, as an environmental scientist i don't see uh, water in isolation with the 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 ecological system you know the hydroecological system even though we have differentiated water into different quality types but uh, they are all uh, defined by uh, their differential services so how do you integrate the hydroecology with the built environment it is through water sensitive urban design and that is you have to integrate the entire water cycle the entire uh, you know movement of water with the built landscape through appropriate design that is a challenge and that is what we are trying to do with master plans and the regional plans we have uh, in delhi there was this concept of uh, national capital and this ncr planning board came up you know national capital regional planning board we tried to create the counter magnet areas around delhi uh, we had gurgaon noida ballabgarh and so many things so many cities like faridabad but actually what happened this counter magnet areas were not very successful because the the larger realities of the the regional plans they were not connected with the local realities and especially the the space uh, like uh, like what we had uh, in uh, you know if you see gurgaon what happened it's a major metropolis megapolis but if you go uh, 304 in 400 years in history the entire urban space was a fragile uh, forest of uh, arabli ranges where uh, there was a small hamlet you know of guru dronachari it is named after dronachari uh, guru gram uh, so you could imagine thousands of years back just few people living in a forest there because the area was designed to be water deficient by nature but now we have made the vertical uh, high rise buildings and we have encroached upon wetlands and water bodies and whenever there is a heavy rain all the roads are flooded because water they are looking for their own territory and they don't find the place to uh, find, to to you know to to have just like a sink and that's why you have the cases of urban flooding so it is trying uh, it is like trying to connect many dots together on a drawing board uh, all the components of water sensitive urban design and you have planning you have to take flood risk you have to take the appropriate design you have to take into consideration green infrastructure the quality is very important and you have to seamlessly uh, integrate into into one unit so that is a big challenge but what is happening all the planning communities they work in isolation at a reach scale you know you get a project small project of uh, town planning uh, but you do not see uh, the upstream and downstream uh, consequences the buffer what is happening uh, with the the communities around how the slums are proliferating around your uh, you know the megapolis hello am i audible you are audible was... yes sir yes sir you are audible uh, so 
So, so interconnections are very critical. You have to connect many things together to make uh, urban sensitive, uh, water sensitive urban design. Uh, the place making is very important. How do you make the flood pathway? How do you integrate storm, storm runoff uh, and give a, a kind of bio retention, you know, to, to, to the, uh, the connected corridors? How do you design the street and highways? Then urban design in terms of uh, the, the, uh, the, the climate, the identity and the vitality and all those things, the element of design that I talked about. Similarly, ecosystem, uh, the, the carrying capacity of the city, the carbon sink, you know, we are talking about carbon neutral city. There's, there's new concept, zero carbon cities. People are trying to uh, develop forest. But uh, when I was making my house, uh, you know, I made my own, I'm not uh, an architect, but using my son's crayon, I designed my house uh, structures by connecting many things together. But I was also trying to calculate the total carbon footprint that I am, am impacting. So every square feet uh, of my house had around two and a half kilogram of iron and uh, uh, if I remember correctly, some 800 uh, bags of uh, cement. And uh, when I went to buy uh, wood, I was very depressed because there were so many logs of, you know, for, uh, the timber that I had to, you know, bring. And I felt really bad that house housing in India is so carbon intensive. We do over, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, uses of uh, concrete, cement, and iron, and, and uh, wood. So I calculated my carbon footprint, and uh, I will tell you briefly that if I have to neutralize my impact, which I made after making my house, I have to plant 400 trees in my lifetime. I calculated that if one tree, uh, how much is the carbon sink? And if I multiply it by, uh, you know, uh, using the calculation, the total carbon footprint that I had, so this is my objective that at least, uh, you know, I'm designing micro forest in my settlement, in my colony where I'm living, at least I can have at least 400 trees in my lifetime. We, we do a lot of plantations and I have planted more than 5,000 myself using many people, but the survival rate is so low, we don't talk about it. I would give you one picture. Uh, just five years back, uh, we had planted around 400 trees but only 20 odd trees are now surviving. They have become a big tree now, 20 out of 400. We had good uh, irrigation, we had uh, created uh, fencing, but you know, we don't understand soil, we don't understand the requirement of the plants and variety, so you learn from the mistakes. So don't go by numbers, whenever there is this, uh, you know, crores of saplings being planted, and you see that the green space is being increased, but reality is very, very different from my personal experience. So right now, the roadside forest and the, the midway forest, we are also uh, capturing into green space, but actually they are not forest actually. In Lucknow, if you see the natural forests are very, very less. Uh, we used to have Musabag forest, we used to have uh, Jankipuram forest and the Pipraghat cantonment forest. You know, they were all uh, together. They, they, was not, they were not fragmented forest, if you see, the historical maps, they were all connected. Anyways, so these interconnections are very critical. Uh, water demand and supply, wastewater and pollution, runoff and the amount of rainfall, the water courses that you have in your fabric, in your city, and the flooding and water pathways, very important to, for the future cities. Now, I'll give you these two pictures. The first left-hand side is what we want to have, the actual river how our small river and drain should look like in our cities. And on your right hand side, if you see, this is a picture of a sea river in Varanasi, you know. Varanasi got named by two rivers, Varuna and Assi. But if you see Varuna and Assi, they are not less than a mucky drain. We have reduced this potential uh, water body into a uh, sewage canal. And who is to be blamed? We have. Varanasi is a city of intellectuals. We have 
a good university. We have Varanasi Development Authority, and and uh, the city has, uh, you know, given so many intellectuals. But what is happening? Why we are not able to save river? Why we have, we are not able to save even 50 meters uh, on the terrace where we could do uh, restoration work? So these are some of the pictures, and uh, you see uh, people have even. Uh, given the outlet of their black water, the toilet water just into this uh, Asi river, which is a very sad situation, dumping yard. This could, river could have been very important for the entire city of Varanasi. But what is happening? Uh, this river is now a drain and we are trying to restore. So just uh, on a lighter note, a uh, few days back, I tweeted, I tweeted a picture of Asi river. You know, you see, uh, this is Asi river and the buildings on both sides and a film director called Anubhav Sinha, you know, you must be knowing, he's director of a movie like Ravan. And he's a famous movie director. He retweeted my tweet. I asked, can you believe this is Assi River of Varanasi? And he said, yes, I can. So even there is a perception among uh, the communities, the famous people, the celebrities, but we are not able to restore it. So there's a big challenge in front of the planning communities how to restore, how to bring back. So we are trying to develop the uh, the floodplain uh, vegetations. And sometimes we do a lot of restorations of smaller systems by doing natural vegetation, mim mimicking how the uh, the terrace should look like. And then we are trying to do with the Kukrail River in uh, Jankipura. And now coming back to riverfront, where, which uh, I don't like very much, it has become a selfie point. And, but if you ask me frankly, I'm against riverfront projects. It is fine if you develop a small bathing heart or a small, uh, you know, uh, approach to the river, urban, uh, to connect urban people. But if you make a eight kilometer wall on both sides and make one small point where, uh, you know, there's a park and people enjoy, but if you actually go and see the water quality, water quality has deteriorated, there's no fish, and uh, water is sinking and still the intercepted drains, they, they, are, uh, uh, they are not functional. And I opposed this project right from very beginning. And when I opposed so much, they said, okay, I'll give you this uh, small, you know, pores for base water. But the base, water, base flow doesn't flow like a channel, just like a predefined, you know, pi, uh, pores. The base flow is very, uh, uh, you know it is lumpy and discrete you can't even see how the base flow is happening and they to uh, satisfy some of us uh, they said at the end when they made the okay we are making some of the holes but these holes must have been clogged by now because the base flow is even uh, uh, down uh, below the sometimes below the uh, scouring depths of the river so i took the satellite pictures of several years and i will not go into detail uh, the river is meandering. The river is not like a straight channel, but we we tried to straighten, we tried to channelize the river and we made uh, into a straight line, just like, I'll give you a few example of two, and uh, this is in Lucknow only, the, how the river is, you know, changing across uh, in, the, in the last decade. These are pictures of uh, linear imaging sensing system, list three camera, list three, list four, IRS 1D. And you see uh, how the river is shifting. You know there are paleo channels and old certain old uh, scars, and they sometimes uh, take this. But what we are trying to do? This is before uh, uh, the river from 2008, and this is after 2016. The entire channel was restricted. The the water uh, the the flow pathway was confined, and there was no breathing space for the river. This is free uh, kind of where we have riverfront, you know, this place where you take selfie and and enjoy ice cream. But for me, this place was very important. This was like lung of the river where river used to take breath and uh, used to recharge the aquifer. These are the sand bars and sand islands where turtles and uh, they do sand, sand basking and uh, uh, all the amphibians, you know, they are they do they lay their eggs on the uh, these sandbars and uh, the, uh, the vegetated river banks are very important for biotic life. But what we did, these are some of the pictures I took using drone camera. Uh, these are how we try to confine 
the uh, channel, you know, active channel, the same picture that I showed you before, this, this see this picture and now see this. We try to uh, make into a straight system. And the biggest blunder was that if you go to uh, Kuria Ghat, you, there is still a, a temporary diaphragm, a temporary earthen, earthen dam. They put millions of tons of uh, silt, clay, which is hard clay, which will choke the river from somewhere else. Uh, you know, Sitapur Road, and this is not a river sand. And they put the geosynthetic bag also because they were not able to confine the middle part where, where you see the JCB. This is the middle of the river. Nowhere in the world I have seen people choking the river like this just in the front in the name of dredging it because you want to dry the river and dredge. There are beautiful, uh, you know, schemes like we, you, if you have to do dredging, you do it in, first of all, in uh, summer season when there's a lean flow. And you do it in a phase manner like London Riverfront, Thames Riverfront was made uh, in 400 years. If you see the history of uh, Thames Riverfront, uh, they, I've gone there, I've spent three months there, and they have they have used the uh, the uh, wood, and uh, the stone pitching is also there. Nowhere it is like straight channeled concrete uh, riverfront using uh, you know 32 mm uh, bar of iron and heavily reinforced wall so okay this was fine i had a huge argument with the engineers uh, that why you're doing this and for that i was also not liked by many people because in the media all were showing the positive sides that soon uh, lucknow would become uh, london and we have london eye but you know you you were fighting with people uh, where who were largely contractors and engineers and the building lobbies so they did not respect the carrying capacity of this river. And now we have still, it is there. They have just made a scape channel here and this river is obstructed now. Uh, these are some of the pictures and see what is happening. The upstream, there is a lot of uh, logging of water hyacinth because now it is not able to flow. And uh, the water hyacinth uh, is just choking the river upstream of Kuria Ghat. If you go there, you'll see, even though they help in treating uh, water, as a biologist and as an environmental scientist, you know, people say that uh, the root systems, they clean water. They are just like cleaner, hyper cleaner. They eat all the heavy metals. They store heavy metals in their bodies. But basically what is happening, they, it is not planned. So what we have to do, you, we have to make a floating channel like this using some, you know, innovative material and then try to plant some of these stretches in some of these stretches where you can treat the water. So, uh, I don't know how much time we have. So, how do you plan and design uh, the urban areas uh, to, to use storm water? Because storm water is very important. I'm coming to storm water because it is mostly neglected in our uh, planning, in our planning documents and our master plans. In natural environments, rainwater gets uh, evaporated and there's evapotranspiration. The plants uh, transpire, uh, you know, they, they lose water. 92% of the water that you put in the plant gets lost through evapotranspiration. And some of them are absorbed by the ground. Uh, in our uh, norm, we, we say that around 10 to 11% of the water which is falling on a unpaved area is actually going to uh, recharge your groundwater which is very less so so if i give you one example lucknow if lucknow is getting around 800 millimeter of rainfall in a year so only about 80 millimeter of water is is being actually going to your uh, aquifers and that too it is very less so the recharge is very very less so so when you uh, dig a bore well uh, sometimes you are also taking the water which is 5,000 years old. You know, in Gurgaon, in Faridabad, people have gone up to 600 feet, 700 feet, and they are the waters which was recharged uh, around 500, 5,000 years back. If you do oxygen isotope dating of the water, you get this signature. So the recharge rate is very, very less. So you have to create enough room for water. So you have to catch water wherever it falls on the catchment and make it uh, like a you know, baffled kind of system where there is enough room, there is enough uh, infiltration of water to your ground. The urban development dramatically changes the process of recharge. If you clear all the vegetation and cover with concrete, 
the water cannot go inside you know so all the water should just run off and would, would cause a huge flooding problem during extensive rain so the rain water runs off these surfaces and storm water drains have been designed but what we have done we have punctured those storm water drains and connected our sewage system sewage system this is happening in classic uh, capital city of delhi and lucknow you know we want to do shortcut whenever there is a flooding uh, or whenever there is a new urban development the most uh, uh, innocent targets are natural drains first and then storm water drains natural drains were designed by the nature to to quickly ease off the flooding situation and to also recharge your rivers but now all those natural drains are becoming your wastewater sewage carrying channels those storm water runoff they contribute significantly to water quality problems of all the fresh water ecosystems and once you have this water sensitive design you would also think of the ecologically sensitive infrastructure when you make a storm water system uh, compatible with your requirement of the local ecology through design through sensitive design you become more uh, you know uh in tune with resilience you you make a resilient resilient city you make climate resilient city because because the the pattern of rainfall is very very old this kind of flashing flood our memories is too short we just go 100 years in history but actually the fla uh, the flash floods and the cloud bursts the intensive in uh, the intense rainfalls they are happening their frequency uh, frequencies have gone up if you read the ipcc fifth assessment report they are saying that the more intense rainy days although the number of rainy days have reduced but the the runoff have increased and uh, the intensity of rainfall has increased so 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 it is a challenge to urban uh, development communities to design the storm water runoff in such a way that it is resilient to future climate so how do you do it before you start building make sure that your plans meet out the requirement of all the criteria that i defined before the water assets are very important the flooding uh, capacity the flood line the maximum the high flood levels the hfl what you call the hfl uh, now they have reduced to 25 to 30 years period they see just in 30 years what was the water uh, submergence area but earlier we used to take 50 years flood uh, high flood levels so we wanted to make uh, more uh, urban development close to rivers so we have also modified our criteria of flooding flood zoning and we are coming closer to the water structure water uh, channels waterways so the natural protection of natural drainage is very important before you start making any project now i'll show you some of the pictures uh, this is the picture that you see is actually used to be a wetland very very large wetland i have the map of uh, 1920 also the topo sheet which were made by Britishers, and uh, it is there in the Texas library. You can also uh, get access to all those old topo sheets of India uh, and the survey of India topo sheets. These are all marked as wetlands and waterlogged areas. It is there in the revenue record also, but nobody's uh, bothered about protect, protecting these important water bodies. I just took these pictures because we are we are monitoring these lay, they, this particular wetland for last 15 years and uh, i complain so many times to all these development authorities to to lucknow municipal corporation but i don't know nothing is happening you see these are all uh, new housing projects all illegal and if you go there even if you take a picture you would be uh, uh, targeted so it is not very uh, you know what you call safe also for an academician to go beyond certain things so but uh, we have been writing about it i said that in lucknow only we have lost 70 percent of the wetlands in just last 30 years i have all the evidences but but somehow uh, there is neglect of water bodies and we are inviting future floods in in uh, in, in the city like uh, lucknow so these are some of the pictures you see very close this area used to be lake uh, just three years back but when i went in 2018 this was all new housing you know all how they do they just put debris and silt and uh, other building materials and they encroach upon 
but still whenever uh, there is water it's all these are all uh, new uh, you know dumping yards there is this apartment has also come up and uh, the entire water body is being lost so coming back to uh, the storm water runoff and why the green and blue space is important in our in our fabric you have to first of all support the healthy ecosystem the the livability the the, the entire resilience the quality of life and the water quality is very important the quality the water of bad quality is like having no water at all so what would you do with a very polluted water it is not even supporting the healthy river functions or the ecosystems so we have been designing uh, some of the dewatch system what what i call the decentralized waste water treatment system you know uh, the decentralized like uh, not a very large centralized structure but small small you know city uh, using uh, artificial wetlands and constructed wetlands natural biofilters using uh, vegetations and natural you know uh, the uh, what you call biofilters or the retention ponds and uh, uh, we take into account uh, the uh, the carrying capacity of the uh, the area the reach the scale and the site specificity you know the context of that area that would influence the design and the behavior of the communities so can you design for actions you know this is a big challenge i all, all, always ask uh, whenever i meet an, uh, an architect or an urban or regional planner i would request him that please make uh, water sensitive design that could influence the human behavior towards more uh, respect for water bodies towards more respect for green space microforest and that should be done by the the awareness of the value system the awareness and the knowledge of the very people you know capacity the knowledge and the caring uh, the capacity of the people in terms of their uh, the local idea the you know people are not aware of these things the identity of the city and the place and the lifestyle so there is this whale framework which was given by uh, skimmer and dyer you can refer to their paper there's a whale framework values awareness identity and lifestyle which is very important for for these some of the, these pressure and drivers this is a picture that i uh, talked about the, the vegetated and non vegetated where you have a lot of runoff in a non vegetated uh, in the urban area and in the forested area the water is getting enough time to infiltrate and improve the base flows and the base flows is coming to support your uh, the water bodies so there is a natural ground cover and uh, the natural ground cover would would allow uh, the retention of storm water these are some of the designs uh, you know uh, whenever you make uh, sideways or the parks there has to be some retention of the runoff and those retention could help the growth of vegetation and uh, the local vegetation particularly and this small green patch is so important for birds for butterflies and all those uh, you know small insects these are some of the examples of retention pond the site retention pond along the roads or the highways also i gave one proposal that if you make a highway please make uh, this kind of buffer which would also prevent uh, the animals to come if you make deep enough especially along the highways and expressways you know many animals are coming but if you make this kind of depression that, that would also uh, you know re recharge the groundwater and that would also support the vegetation some of the hydroscapes and the greenscapes the green roof is also coming in a very big way there is a company in us uh, they have started a few years back they even come to your house and make the entire roof green by planting you know beautiful garden uh, and these are some of the small green patches in a kind of uh, you know urban neighborhood where you could have more sensitivity towards green this is a uh, gomti river before and after i am showing that what was there before river front and after river front the same area now i would give you one example of one uh, restoration that i did in my colony this is there is a very big lake in my colony where i stay in lucknow and this is picture when uh, whenever i uh, go uh, to delhi when i 
when I land at Lucknow airport, I see this lake and I came, I made my house because of this lake. I thought that I could reclaim at least seven hectare of lake and make into a strong, vibrant water body. So it was not even visible just three, four years back. It was just a junkyard. And uh, what we did, I had to uh, come into the RWA, Residence Welfare Association, and fight an election, you know, like this was so important. People said, if you want to do it, you have to come in front and you have to be part of the RWA and to convince the people that this area could be converted into a very vibrant area. So I fought the election and this is a very, very big colony. There are more than 3000 residents. And I gave a PowerPoint presentation during one of our meetings of RWA and you know how RWA functions very hot and volatile. People thought that I'm going to capture their lands and there were many encroachments. So they were all against uh, this thing, some of them, but not all of them, 90% of the people supported this project. And I just made this diagram with and convinced people with simple language. And we took the help of uh, JCB around 300 to, uh, if I remember correctly, 300 hours of actual JCB operation. You know, JCB would charge around 700 rupees per hour. So I used to monitor each and every hour of uh, restoration and directing the person who is doing that, don't disturb these small vegetated pools. And we created some of the vegetated islands also for the birds and, uh, you know, the, you see the lotus is coming. And uh, this was also covered in some of the newspapers that Siberian birds were also coming. And uh, this entire area, sadly, it was being here. You see this picture, it was being enclosed by building mafias. But uh, with the help of uh, Lucknow Municipal Corporation, we saved the seven hectare of uh, land which was enclosed. But uh, in my three years, in my two years of uh, serving into RWA, I had to face a lot of roadblocks. But now people uh, realize that this area has become so important for even recharging the water, you know, the rainwater, because it is helping even in uh, letting all the storm water go into this wetland. Now, I don't, I don't know how much time I have, uh, if I can get any response, because I wanted to touch upon master plans. You have 45 minutes, sir, you have 45 minutes. Okay, so, after giving you this restoration picture, let me come back to why we make uh, mistakes in the master plans. So I try to go into deter, uh, deeper details into the master plans of Lucknow, and we wanted to assess why the land suitability is not taking care of the, the environment, the green and uh, the water space. And how do you integrate the spatial and non-spatial things uh, into a platform using all those land use classes? and develop water sensitive urban planning system. So this is Lucknow, you know, it was a multicultural city. I, I would give you just brief historical background because this city is very classic city. I love this city and I like this city very much. And uh, I feel I'm very connected to all the water bodies and all the forest whenever I go to Ghat or cantonment area or even Lohia Park or Musabag or close to river. These are my some of the spots where I go regularly and uh, I have developed a close connection with the city because of uh, the city loves me and I love the city. So it's like a one-to-one -one connection. And I started reading a lot about uh, Lucknow because I came to Lucknow just 15 years back in 2005. I was in Delhi and uh, I started reading about history, how the uh, city of Nawabs flourished in 18th and 19th century. So after 1350 AD, Lucknow and parts of Awadh was under the rule of Delhi Sultanate, Mughal empires, Nawabs of Awadh, the East India Company and the British Raj. And this was one of the major centers of Indian rebellion of 9, 1857. You have the residency as a mark of the struggle of uh, you know, independence. Uh, but Janab, you know, Nawab Asuf Dola, he shifted the capital from Awadh to, uh, from Fezawar to Lucknow in 1774 because the capital of Awadh was in Faisalabad and not in Lucknow, and it was in 1774. He preferred to settle on the right bank of the river Gomti because it was on the highest terrace. So I looked for the map, I went to residency and I looked for the older maps and I found this picture, the small, you know, the settlements which was there near Madiao on the northern terrace of the river. This was the place where uh, Asifuddallah preferred to, you know, develop the 
capital. And he knew exactly that the higher, higher ground is always safe from floods and uh, you know the disasters of the bank flows of the river Gomti because the river Gomti used to flood a lot. Even in 70s and 80s, uh, you have the pictures of people uh, rowing small boats in uh, Shanajaf Road in Hazrat Ganj in on chalk and uh, all the bank floods uh, used to come to this uh, wherever we have now the shopping centers now this is a picture classic picture capture of lucknow you see the famous iconic uh, you know structure of lucknow the rumi gate and uh, this city had seen a lot of turmoil a uh, lot of uh, struggle and whatever built landscape that you see it should be uh, the historical landscape should be protected preserved and uh, whatever new settlements are coming up they should respect that lucknow should look like uh, the same that the city should have same charm and flavor what it used to have before and all the british soldiers looting kasarwa complex kasarwa complex was a very big area and uh, now you see the kasarwa complex if you see the aerial drone picture you would have this idea how this Kasarba complex used to look like in historical times. Now, this is a map of 1902 United Province. Earlier, it was known as UP. Now, we call Uttar Pradesh, but actually, it was United Province. <coughs> These are some of the older pictures from Lamart and Kasarba complex and the Havelock Road. And now, these new settlements coming around, you know, the uh, across the trans the area and uh, you know, Shahid Pat, the new garden. So how a small settlement in 1847 now is, is becoming more and more. In 2011, it was just 303 square kilometer of urban core. Now the urban core is around uh, 400 square kilometer now, right now, just like I give you 2019, we have new master plan called uh, the Mahavistar Yosna, the new Ma urban development code, which is coming up. And the entire area is around 2,500 square kilometer, the entire, entire Lucknow, but the city is just about 400 square kilometer. But now we have even gone beyond 400 square kilometer of urban core, and we are eating upon this all peri-urban areas, you know, the, the entire 2,522 uh, square kilometer of the main uh, district. And this is a peri-urban rim, which would also become urban. These are quite dynamic area. So I worked on peri-urban tra land transformations and we made the various maps how the urban sprawl happened right from 72 onwards, how the new structures came up, how the new structures being added to the older structures. And these are some of the figures, how the land was transformed in Lucknow in the last 25 years. And the agriculture was a major, you know, uh, casualty of our urban planning. We, we had class one agricultural land, Malihabad, and uh, even uh, Aliganj area. Uh, Aliganj, uh, you know, uh, used to be. Uh, it used to be, and a big, big kind of uh, horticulture built. Many fruit plants used to be there. So we lost wetlands. Also, we lost built uh, the uh, rural areas which were converted to built-up areas. So if you see that around 62.98% of agriculture land we just lost. We lost around 1.19% of wetlands and forest also we are losing. Obviously, we, there is plantation, but actually as a whole, you cannot create forest in even 25 years. It takes time, it takes time to create uh, actual natural forest. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, sir. Uh, there are some questions from the uh, participants. Uh, you would like to uh, take that questions? Yeah, sure. I'd love to take some of the questions. Uh, sir, here. there is a question by Shivani Singh. She is asking, uh, will the kunds like Bakshi Gatalab or ponds still existing in Lucknow? Will all yes. the, uh, or they will be useful for the catchment area? Can you give few existing examples of these natural or man-made catchment in the in Lucknow area? See, Lucknow, we are, there are many ponds still there. If you go to, uh, like Bakshi Gatalab is one example, BKT, but the, it used to be very large. There is one, uh, you know, uh, what you call uh, near uh, Rajajipuram area, uh, Moti Jhil, you know, Moti Jhil, Moti Jhil. Moti Jhil used to be quite large. Then Havat Mau Tala, Binayaki Jhil, uh, Binayaki Jhil in, uh, in, in near uh, Telibag area, now it is fragmented. Similarly, uh, your Kathauta Jhil, Kathauta Jhil, half, uh, less than half portion is now existing as a natural lake. 
The other part is being converted into a water kind of third water work by the Lucknow Jalinum. But actually, the entire uh, area used to be wetland, you know, the Kathota area, because this was the the backwater of uh, Gomti River, the new urban extension that is happening. So there are many water bodies still there, but we are losing every year because of the urban development bad master plan and uh, even by giving approvals because we don't uh, go to the site when we give approval to these people and uh, the land mafias are also at play. So, so there are many factors, but of course we can restore some of them. Yeah, I think I have. Uh, there is another question. Is lack of public participation in urban planning by, uh, by our planners also a drawback? Yes, it's a very big drawback, you know. Uh, we have uh, public participation in our environmental impact assessment projects like we have several projects where you have mandatory public participation uh, where you can go and uh, in master plan also there 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 is a there is a public participation because i remember correctly when delhi development authority when i was in delhi way back in my college days there was this master plan came up uh, delhi master plan and they asked for public uh, you know comments and i wrote and I used to get letters from DDA to come in the court and give statements, you know, because there were many cases of illegal and squatter settlements. But actually, it is the the uh, the public participation is not done in a very transparent and open manner. It is there in somewhere in small newspaper. You'll find one small, you know, ad that there's a master plan and people are invited. They can get a copy, but you'll never get a complete copy. You'll get just executive summary, and many of the experts are even not getting the entire copy and uh, the reason is that the land is very important resource so whenever you have a big chunk of land which is just in the uh, just visible to those you know big people so they want to uh, hide from the public and they want to just uh, change the land use from uh, say wetland from a forest to a built up area and change of land use is done so rampantly that i would not be surprised if i would say that delhi uh, master plan was changed 1000 1, times you know, even though it may be just 200 times or 300 times, but actually, if you see the small, small change, land use change that they do in the master plan, uh, it is quite big. And public, uh, they are uh, send up, uh, they are never consulted in a in an open uh, system, in an open manner where people can go and talk about it, and they can, you know, they can talk about the uh, the, the entire carrying capacity of the city and the future future projections. So yes, you are right. Uh, we are not able to make good master plans because uh, we do not consult public at large. Yes, uh, thank you, sir, for your uh, answers. So we have uh, 10 minutes left uh, in your session. So we are uh, next panel is, is online. So we have right. to start the next session at uh, 11.30. So I, I, I should conclude in 10 minutes now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. So coming back to the master plan, you know, in Lucknow, there's a classic um, case of master plan. There are two master plans. There are two uh, development authorities. One is Avas Vikas UP housing development, you know, what you call Avas Vikas, and one is Lucknow Development Authority. So they have their uh, master plan, the city master plan by Avas Vikas, and this is the Lucknow city master plan. And when I started this project, I had a tough time to digitize the master plan because nothing was there. There was just old map and uh, we were struggling to find which color so we went to a small town and country planning there's one department we got hold of the land suitability map and we got the and uh, the, the, the 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 printout of the map was also not very clear so we gave uh, we categorized we uh, we were doing this isro project you know you see the isro sag response project we did 2009 to 11 we made uh, the land use conflicts so when we uh, went to the site and when we said that okay it is green area but there's a built-up area and we went there and checked with the authority they said it might be due to printing mistake because some green color is there so they just uh, bucked like that that th th this might be due to uh, you know the printing mistake but actually it was not due to printing mistake so we did a lot of uh, modeling work we do, did uh, land utility you know types and land utility land suitability conflict analysis I will not go into detail, but I'll just show you the map, how we did uh, land suitability and conflict. Basically, we 
we took the criteria of soil landscape infrastructure and land use and we categorize further into factors like soil into group texture agriculture solidity lands landscape suitability into geomorphology slope groundwater depth infrastructure into road rail city sewerage water and morpho land use suitability is very important green belt wetlands wastelands and given fuji ranking and weights by consulting experts and based upon those rankings we made several maps and uh, and uh, you know overlaid into master plans so when we overlaid into master plans we saw a lot of land use transformations happening natural is uh, getting lost so we categorized into loss which could be critical loss or could be gain also because some of the rural land we are getting back transitional land we are losing urban is like so we categorized into loss and gain and uh, if i tell you the pictures the red color that you see on the urban fringe these are all at loss because we are losing the critical carrying capacity and the water the green space and the blue space we are losing at a higher rate and that was during 97 to 9, 2009 the picture had changed even much and we did micro planning even at a block level we categorized these are some of the layers the ground water the uh, city development boundaries the slums the soil map the geomorphology the water bodies the flood plains and these are using those criteria land suitability criteria we made proximity analysis land suitability soil suitability and sub models like infrastructure suitability how your future development should uh, be supportive and if you see the final map the urban suitability map using those two models the fuji hp and the traditional hp only 22% of the land was suitable for future urban growth that means the city can go up to further to 22 to 23% so right now it is like 400 square kilometer so you can go further by maybe uh, you know 80 square kilometer or uh, 100 square kilometer the pure urban the rest should be 200 2000 square kilometer should be like uh, supportive of the lo local agriculture if you want to talk about the new concept of growing locally and eating locally and having resilient and smart cities so you could have a smart city but the urban fringe and the peri urban area is very very important so these are all the conflict analysis and uh, uh, what we did when we superimposed the restricted and constrained areas on the master plans the proposed master plans we got the land use conflicts so land, land use conflicts we got and these are all the 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 area that i showed you before those are not in unity with the master plan of the lucknow development authority or the up housing development board so these are all conflict analysis how the future urban extension they are in in not uh, respecting the carrying capacity of the city now the conclusions and policy implications of this work basically uh, if you look into the master plans uh, they deviate too much from the preferred land suitability if you do all kinds of analysis they deviate a lot and uh, the extension of the land use is not linear or nodal we wanted to make compact city because uh, the the concept of uh, the concept of space and land use is changing in uh, in the modern uh, you know cities and people advocate for compact city to avoid transportation and to avoid carbon footprints and with uh, you know the city connected to a vibrant rural areas that would support the rural economy also but here the urbanization seems to spread radially in all the directions without any development code and the influence of transport infrastructure was also minimal we thought that wherever there is a highway or new road there would be a lot of urban growth but it was not like that the influence of transport was minimal wherever people saw there is a piece there is a Uh, of course it was strong the growth around the the uh, the you know road and the highways but we also saw a lot of squatter settlements happening the urban sprawls happening in the isolated patches where there were there were there was loose connectivity of transport network so there was intensification of urban core few open areas and uh, many water bodies were landfilled to accommodate future residential developments and urban expansion was happening a lot at the suburban and peri urban areas 
uh, which were earlier, you know, the class one agricultural land, permanent crop and pastures land, grazing land. So therefore, with the process of urban sprawl, conserved areas like green bales and open spaces and flood plains, they are threatened and will be rendered fragile, very fragile in times to come because they will not be able to sustain if you lose groundwater, even the forest would die after some time because they depend upon the groundwater for most of the time. Any future urban land transformation should be done very, very carefully, taking into account all the zoning regulations, you know, carrying capacity, green belt, agricultural land, open space, amenities, all those things. And finally, you have to look into the, uh, the river restorations of uh, you know, the smaller river channels. And uh, so I would stop here. Uh, I don't know. Uh, if time is thank there, you, I would thank you. you are on time, very much on time. Uh, thank you, sir, Venkatesh, sir, for such a wonderful and day-to-day uh, -day relevant presentation about sustainable water management. And it was said that uh, next World War will be for water. So it is very important for us to incorporate such, uh, sensitive water, urban landscape in the or urban planning in in the city planning itself. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you. So uh, we will be back uh, for the next session after five minutes. Uh, so you okay. can join with the same link. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Hmm? So you have to join with the same link after five minutes. Thank you all.